So what made you become a doctor, Dr. Goldsberry? Um, I think um, my uncle, who was a doctor in Oklahoma, I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. I had an uncle who uh, practiced in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I would visit him often and sometimes tag along as he made his house calls and visit. And I think that probably influenced me. Um, and I think I always wanted to be in a helping profession. My parents were teachers, and I thought I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> I wanted to do something else. I was always interested in science and math, and um, I had a college professor who encouraged me to proceed to medicine. Um, so I began. Um, so where did you go to medical school? I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, I had, um, actually, at that time, uh, there were few schools in the South that uh, minorities could attend. In fact, I was the first female who was admitted to the University of Oklahoma School of Medicine. Okay. But I decided I didn't want to be sort of the one and only minority at the school, so I decided I would go to... Uh, Howard University in Washington. Okay. There were a couple of uh, primarily minority medical schools, Howard in Washington and Meharry in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so I chose Howard and I was accepted there. Okay. Uh, so what year did you graduate? I graduated in 1957. That sounds like a long, long time ago, doesn't it? <laughs> so wh what did you choose as your specialty in medicine? I chose psychiatry. Yeah, I was really interested initially in pediatrics, and um, I decided to take a year in psychiatry, and once I started, I decided to stay and move into child psychiatry. Okay. So what year did you start practicing here in Worcester? I Probably about six years later, I did an internship. I did three years of um, adult psychiatry, two years of child psychiatry, and... Uh, so about six years later, I, w I officially started practicing. Um, before we move on to your practice, is there anything else you want to talk about from medical school or your residency or your internship? Any other um, things you want to mention? Well, I guess, you know, back in those days, uh, there weren't a lot of women in medicine. That's just the opposite now. Right. But um, in a class of 75, there were six or seven girls, and uh, we kind of stuck together. and. I think it, uh, we consistently got the message that we were taking the spots of a guy who could have been in that slot and we were just going to get married and have kids and not really practice medicine. So, uh, you know, we were continually giving that message. And I think the, um, there were very few women in fields like surgery and uh, many women went into pediatrics in those days. Uh, how much did it cost for you to go to medical school? Well, I think the actual tuition was only $500. That we had to buy books and we had to uh, pay for lab fees. Um, so, you know, you would think maybe $1,000. Uh, and I was, you know, going to school away from home, so it was room and board. So I think my parents probably spent no more than about $2,000 um, for me a year. So quite different from now. Did the cost of medical school ever influence how you or your or your peers practiced medicine at first? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Most of the, um, you know, your parents sort of supported you or there were some in my class who may have been older and they, their wives supported them. But I think it, um, I think there wasn't a huge difference in the state medical schools. There may have been some difference and if you went to school someplace else. Um, but it didn't really influence my, my choice of medical school or where I would practice. Okay. How do you think uh, young doctors today are influenced by the cost of medical school and their choices after graduation? Oh, I think very much so, because the state medical schools are clearly less expensive than uh, some of the other medical schools. And I think there's a commitment to practice in the state if you attend one of those medical schools. I don't think you have to, but uh, there's certainly uh, a thought about that given. Um, so I think, I think it is, you know, because the cost of medical schools is very, very expensive, particularly if, you, if 
for some students, I know, have to assume some cost in college, and on top of that, medical school, and feels like they're forever paying off the debt of being in medical school. I, I didn't have that worry. So describe a typical day when you first started practicing here in Worcester. Well, I guess I've always practiced in um, a clinic setting primarily. I had a small private practice, but my primary base of practice was in a clinic. And I was at that point in child psychiatry and worked in an outpatient mental health center. So that um, my, my uh, day was primarily 8.30 to, to 5 or 6. Okay. And... Um, um, I, there weren't many patients that I had that, w that were hospitalized. There were very few patients, particularly in child psychiatry in that day. Um, so mo most of my practice was uh, 9 to 5 in an outpatient setting. Okay. And uh, how did your day change over the years of practice? It, um, well, over the years of practice, I, pr I went more into administration. My last, say, 10 to 15 years of practice, I was more in administration. Um, during part of my years, I did a lot of school consultation. I worked for the Worcester Juvenile Court, so that instead of being in that center all day long, I was out in the community. I would visit um, schools, and uh, I would spend a couple of days a week working at the Worcester Juvenile Court. Um, I provided some consultation to uh, some residential settings. So for a while, um, at least half of my time was spent outside the outpatient center and in community settings or in residential programs. Did you ever make a house call of any kind? Yes, I did. I enjoyed that very much. Okay. Um, I would go to visit um, families uh, who were troubled and, and uh, um, you know, talk with them about their, their kids and have some very interesting stories about uh, house calls. You know, I remember one young lady who was very, very phobic, a teenage girl, and she had, would just refuse to go to school, refuse to leave her house. And my colleague, a social worker, and I visited the home uh, on a number of occasions, and um, gradually that youngster was able to go to school and to, uh, to move out into the community. But I, I enjoyed making house calls. And how else did you communicate with your patients outside of the office besides house calls? Um, well, I'd again meet them in schools or um, other other settings if, where I was doing consultation. Um, you know, talk, certainly talk to them on the telephone. Um, and if I saw them at the hospital. So I was very much in the community. <laughs> How was your time uh, divided between the hospital and the office exactly? I might have. We had I had very few patients who were in the hospital. Um, I was had privileges at St. Vincent's Hospital, and just the most seriously disturbed youngsters would be hospitalized. Suicidal youngsters, um, very severe uh, disorders were hospitalized. So my hospital practice was really very very small. Um, you know, most of my work was not done in the hospital setting. So who were your patients, uh, well, in terms of where they came from? Like, were most of them from around the Worcester area? Yes, most of them came from the, came from the Worcester area. Yeah, they, they were, since I was in child psychiatry, they were youngsters all the way from 3 to 18, and, and their families. Um, uh, very important that parents were involved in uh, treatment and siblings, so, um, but they were from the Worcester area. On occasion, I would maybe provide consultation to a residential program outside of Worcester. I once was providing consultation to a setting up in the Gardner area, but um, you know, primarily the patients and my work was in Worcester. Did patients choose their physician? Some did and some, some didn't for me because I was in the clinic setting. Uh, we were assigned patients. Certainly there were in that setting um, cases that asked for me or in my private practice they selected me. But I you know, had many cases that um, you know, they were the next number on the list that I would take. 
So what do you think it was like for your family to have a physician, or in your case, two physicians in the household? Um, well, I, I think my kids um, kind of accepted that. Um, you know, I think we try to cover them between my husband and myself or provide care from other people. Uh, there were times when I wasn't home and they seemed to, to go with the flow. I'm sure there were times when they uh, wished we had been here and not a caretaker, but um, um, I think for the most part we, we tried to be home in the evenings. Uh, we didn't have busy, busy times like after six or seven in the evenings. Supper probably was a little later than maybe for some families. And uh, I can remember my husband going to some um, like pe meetings at school that I couldn't attend. And, um, but I think for the most part, our children were important to us and we tried to make ourselves available and tried to help them with the homework. Um, but they had, their grandfather was a physician and I think they were used to uh, being around medical people and uh, I, I think, I don't think it was unusual for them. <laughs> but I hear stories now that they are all grown <laughs> about what it was like when they, when they were kids. And I think there probably were some times when we weren't around. Did you take vacations? Yes, we took vacations, uh, uh, usually in the summertime. Um, there were times, the school vacations, that um, we would have to have other coverage when they were little. Um, but we certainly took vacations. We had to receive phone calls. I mean, I think they grew up knowing that, be quiet, I'm on the phone with the patient, <laughs> and uh, go into the other room, you know. So, um, and they, as they got older, would answer the phone. And I remember having some patients that they were even familiar with, and they would say, it's that lady again, you know. <laughs> so, but I think they were, you know, accustomed to that. So what made you keep being a physician for so long? What did you really like about your practice? Well, I, I, um, I enjoyed really uh, helping families to be able to cope with their children. And then seeing kids that you were able to appropriately diagnose and treat really grow up and have a good adjustment in life. That was, that was enjoyable and interesting. All right, well, I'm going to move on to the science of medicine. Okay. Now. What were the most typical illnesses that you dealt with early in your practice? Uh, well, if, if we're talking about uh, psychiatry, um, you know, I, I think there were, there were kids and families who weren't getting along. We saw, um, you know, ADHD kids, hyperactive kids. Yeah, I saw some pretty disturbed kids back in those days who were, say, psychotic. And, you know, I think we didn't know as much then, certainly, as we know now. Um, but um, before I, I went into child psychiatry, I must say I was in, I spent my residency in adult psychiatry and worked in the state hospitals and, and saw some really very, very disturbed people. And back in those days, uh, people were hospitalized for much longer uh, you know, in the state hospitals. And uh, again, we didn't have the treatment that we do now. And uh, they were given like shock therapy and, um, you know, wards and wards of people who were so disturbed they had to be secluded or restrained. Those were back in my days of residency. And certainly that adult practice has very much changed. Right. So did the illnesses that you treated among children change uh, a great deal over the subsequent decades? You know, I, I think we, we know so much more now and uh, what we are, are labeling or diagnosing now, we didn't, we didn't diagnose, but I think kids probably presented with in child psychiatry some of the same uh, symptoms and signs, but we, we know so much more now and are able to, uh, to treat them. Certainly, um, you know, generally in medicine, the Infectious diseases, I think, has been the area where there's been monumental change since my day. And, uh, you know, you, you saw kids who, um, who had more medical illnesses, more infectious diseases, and, you know, that influenced their, their adjustment. But that, there have been just monumental changes back in uh, now. And I think the whole um, differentiation between what's neurological and what's psychological, psychiatric,
uh, is much clearer now. I think we didn't have the diagnostic tools to, um, to differentiate that. Um, when I think of autism, way back, we thought it was a, a parent-child problem, that early interactions with your parents influence the symptomatology of autism. And now, I think we know that you know, there really is a, a more medical diagnostic, medical basis, neurological basis to autism. So I think, you know, we, we may have seen some of the same kids, but we know so much more now than years ago. Yeah. So what was the greatest challenge for you to treat early in your career? Which I think working with parents, you know, getting parents to um, uh, first bring their youngster on a regular basis for treatment, to um, look at their own behavior, um, and uh, you know, I think we saw kids and poor kids. There were so many circumstances that affected a child's well-being um, that were difficult to help. And uh, so, I, I think getting kids to treatment uh, early on, before their problems became so severe, and engaging parents in treatment uh, was probably one of the most difficult things in, in trying to help kids. Have those problems changed over the years? Um, I think they're still there. Right. Um, you know, I think there's so much um, in the media about um, children with problems that uh, certain parents are much more willing to say, well, I need to participate in the treatment. I need to be a part of that. You know, on the other hand, you certainly hear a lot more about child abuse and neglect. And, um, you know, there continue to be uh, parents who um, abuse their kids and who don't want to participate in treatment, who are sent to treatment by an agency and are not willing participants. So that problem certainly continues to treat. I think more people are coming for treatment because agencies are identifying them and referring them for treatment than when I first started practice. The whole category of, of people did not come for treatment or or I think it, we didn't uh, so readily understand the issues of child abuse and neglect back then. What have you seen as one of the most important breakthroughs in disease treatment throughout the course of your career, either in child psychiatry or general medicine? Well, certainly, um, you know, I think we know so much more about, um, about medication and how it helps. I think we would give medication, um, you know, based on symptoms, and I think we didn't understand as much what were the side effects of some of the medication. There's just so much more research, and particularly in kids. I think um, kids were the bottom of the list in terms of research, and now I think more attention is given to research and for medication, psychiatric medications in children. So that we, um, you know, more uh, pharmaceutical companies or, or uh, doing research or there are more medications, more specific medications for kids. And I think certain disorders, um, we know more about them and we know um, the course of the illness and, you know, how medication can help. So that I think in child psychiatry, uh, when, I was, when I first started, very few kids received medication, for example just the very, very seriously disturbed. And now I think we're identifying uh, disorders earlier and we're more appropriately treating with, with medication and sort of identifying those that don't need medication but more course of, of psychotherapy. Um, but certainly in the general field of medicine, infectious disease is one of the biggies, I think, that's made monumental changes. Um, um, we know so much more about. Um, you know, tuberculosis, polio, um, some of those disorders that used to be um, sanatoriums and, you know, are, are not the, the problems that they used to be. So there have been monumental mental changes. Then I think diagnostic procedures, you know, we know so much more about now and we're able to use more effectively than before. Would you briefly describe how attitudes towards smoking and cancer have changed throughout the course of your practice? Oh, very much. So I remember in medical school, 
felt like half the class smoked and we, we'd be sitting in these uh, rooms when you dim the slides, the dark rooms and the smoke filled rooms, that's my memory, and, and your eyes would be watering from the smoke. <laughs> and uh, certainly I think, um, you know, wasn't thought that smoking was so hazardous to your health. And certainly thought wasn't given to the people who were exposed to smoke who didn't smoke and the hazards to, to your health if you didn't smoke but you were sitting in this smoke-filled room. Certainly it's, it's been much, diff it's much different now than it was before. I think again we know more about the consequences of smoke for those smokers as well as those who are in rooms where there's smoke. What is something that doctors seem to take for granted now in terms of technology that you didn't have at some point in your career? Well, I think some of the, um, some of the diagnostic procedures, certainly some of the um, um, radiological techniques that just weren't available now, I think, are, are, are uh, so readily available now uh, that doctors take for granted. Um, and um, again, some, some of the say, infectious diseases, some of the medications that just weren't available way back then, and people were, were dying because of that. Um, so I, I think some of the technology and some of the um, procedures that are so readily available now were, were just not available way back then. Um, so there have been monumental advances in medicine over the 45 years that, that, uh, since I started in the field since I first was an intern. And how about specifically in psychiatry or child psychiatry? There... Well again, the, um, when I first started there were, there were very few medications used okay. and primarily for the most seriously disturbed kids. And now I think they're, um, for example, ADHD. Um, you know, they're, they're kids who um, are appropriately diagnosed and started on, on medication. Um, and some of the um, some of the prevention that we do now, I think, you know, wasn't thought of before. There's not a lot of technology, I would think, in child psychiatry, but more in the area of medication that there's been monumental changes. Okay. Describe one important invention that you've seen in medicine. You mean uh, not necessarily child psychiatry or psychiatry, yes. but um, again, the CAT scan is, I think, is 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 uh, a huge invention that uh, has made a monumental difference and allowed um, diagno diagnosis early or a clarified diagnosis. Uh, I think that's just a monumental invention that that has been made, made a big difference in the field of medicine. What technology is still used uh, frequently in medicine that you used back in medical school? Well, um, so, you know, certainly some of the, the x-rays are still, you know, still used that were used back then. They've just um, changed and modified and improved. Um, and, you know, some of, some of the, um, well, I'm thinking about infectious diseases, some of the ways that you know what you're dealing with are, are primarily the same. Um, all of, you know, some improvements, but primarily the same. Um, but you know, we had um, get some lab technology that was back then um, that we still use today. Um, hematology, some of that is improved, but was back then used. Um, yeah, some things were in place 45 years ago. <laughs> Is there anything that you would like to see invented, a uh, piece of technology, uh, new medication procedure, I don't know, anything just generally in medicine or in psychiatry? Well, I, you know, I think uh, sort of being a woman, there's um, like major advances in um, like the test for prostate cancer. And I think there's, they're moving forward like ovarian cancer is a disorder that is a, is silent in women and is not so easily diagnosed and they proceeding to have a blood test I think it's not so clear-cut as say for men who have prostate cancer so I'd like to see um, I continuing to work on that and 
and to, to have uh, blood tests or some earlier diagnosis for ovarian cancer for women because it's still um, something that is not clear early on and um, you know, I would hope that there would be improvement in the diagnosis of ovarian cancer, some blood test or way of finding that out early on. What were some of the most important drugs that you used early in your practice and have those changed over the years? Well, probably some of the antipsychotic drugs and I think what what we know so much more about are the side effects. You know, I think we we saw the improvement in some symptomatology, but we weren't as clear about what were some of the hazards and side effects of some of those really early medications. So I, th I think we know more about that now. Um, and, um, you know, we're much more careful about giving some of those drugs. And there are other drugs now that um, are included in the spectrum of drugs available that probably have fewer side effects. So, you know, I think there was such um, a push to uh, reduce the symptoms and not as careful a look at some of the side effects from those early drugs. So um, in psychiatry, you know, one of the early drugs was used to treat very severe psychiatric disorders and antipsychotic drugs. Did you always have access to the drugs that you wanted to use? Not, not really. I think we would, um, you know, certain drugs you hear about and uh, they're not readily available on the market. And, um, you know, I think I found you know, one of the ways to find out was to go to conferences to find out what was new, what was coming down, what was available, as well as talking to some of the drug representatives. So that, um, you know, I think it, uh, once a drug was approved, um, you know, I think I had access to it. But um, you would hear about certain things being used and they weren't quite on the market yet. But I, I think it's in terms of once they were approved, I had access to the drugs. Okay. How did changes in the drug industry affect your practice? You know, I, I think the, uh, probably in my last 15 years, there were uh, so many new drugs that were being produced. Um, it felt a while that you could become comfortable with a group of drugs in various categories that you would use. And, um, you know, I think there's nothing like your own personal use and feeling comfortable knowing the individual variations, the side effects, the positive responses that you would feel comfortable using a drug. In the last, my last 10 or 15 years, there were so many new drugs on the market. And part of it had to do with patients coming to you saying, you know, I've heard this drug, I saw it in a magazine, I've heard it talked about, why can't I use this drug? What's, you know, you, you need to be giving me this drug. So I think you, your, <laughs> your patients came forth talking about that. And um, I think for me, just keeping up with what was new, what were the downside, what were the indications, the contraindications, uh, you know, got to be uh, difficult to go to conferences, to talk to your colleagues, but the experience in your own practice to me was uh, comforting when you, when you saw enough patients to feel comfortable about using a particular drug. So I think the many drugs on the market <laughs> in my last years of practice and patients coming uh, requesting certain medications um, made you really need to, to be absolutely up to date on what was, what was good and what uh, what were the, again, the contraindications and the indications, and the individual variations. Okay. I, I think the good news was the, you know, much for child psychiatry, there was much more research being done on kids, which was the good news, you know, because before kids were again at the bottom of the list, and um, you would be giving drugs to kids, you know, I think without as much research as we have today.
Well, before we move on uh, from the science of medicine, is there anything else you would like to mention in terms of changes in child psychiatry or psychiatry in general? Well, I think uh, in my early training, um, there was a big emphasis on psychotherapy, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, and the role of the psychiatrist was as much being a therapist as it was in being a psychopharmacologist. I think in the last few years, uh, the psychiatrist has more and more been pushed into the role of the psychopharmacologist. And uh, I think part of that is the, um, the insurance companies not wanting to pay psychiatrists for doing psychotherapy. And uh, we're pushed into the role of the psychopharmacologist. So in, in my early training, the psychiatrist very much was involved in uh, providing psychotherapy and some psychiatrists in psychoanalysis. And I think much more of the training and the push from who will pay for what has moved psychiatrists into becoming uh, psychopharmacologists. Okay. How did patients without money receive health care early in your career? Um, I think in Worcester there were um, health clinics the public health department had health and general health clinics and there were <clears throat> outpatient clinics that um, had fees that were reduced for people who couldn't pay the the full fee um, but certainly there were many people who uh, who dot, did not receive the care that they needed back then but um, now I think there are community health centers that provide some of that care and much more involvement of outreach workers and uh, people um, trying to get people involved in thinking about their health care. Um, so I'm sure there were groups of people or who did not have adequate health care way back then. Okay. Over the years, how do you think Worcester is compared to other places in terms of providing care for the underserved? Well, you know, Worcester has community mental health centers. Um, and some of the HMOs have a commitment to serve um, Medicaid patients. But when you hear that Worcester has a high infant mortality rate, they have a high teenage pregnancy, uh, you can't help but wonder that there's more work to be done. I think Worcester has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the state. So that when you hear this, you feel, gee, there's, there's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. But um, Worcester does have two really great community um, health centers, mm -hmm. um, and I think the public health department, <clears throat> the work with schools is, um, you know, Worcester does very well. But I think there's certainly a lot more that can be done. What were some fears and concerns about socialized medicine in the 50s and 60s? I think the uh, physicians thought that, um, you know, their private practice would not be the same, that the, uh, there would be governmental agencies would be uh, telling physicians how to practice medicine, and that you would not have uh, the opportunity again to develop your private practice and treat your patients in the way that you thought they should be treated. Were physicians ever involved politically on the topic of socialized medicine? I think they were, but probably they weren't the activist groups that they are now, because they are physicians groups um, that really lobby and speak out actively, I think much more now than back then. You know, there were a few people who were activists and who spoke up, but not as many physicians were as actively involved as they are today. What were your feelings on Medicare and Medicaid when they came around in the 60s? Well, I guess I thought it was a good thing, and it, it should, I thought, enable more people to have adequate care. The elderly, the disabled and the elderly, um, I thought would benefit from the Medicare, and poor people would have easier access because of Medicaid. And how have your feelings on those subjects changed? You know, I, I think it, it, it feels in the last five years that instead of um, 
providing enough dollars to really have people have the care that they need, that hasn't happened. And more and more, the funding for Medicare and Medicaid um, has not increased, and people are not getting adequate care. Um, so I think, you know, the thought is good, but I think um, there should be more funding for both those programs, Medicare and Medicaid. I think they're elderly people who are um, just not receiving the care they should, and poor people who are not receiving the care they should. How do you feel that the government's involvement in health care and you know, managed care has affected physicians specifically? Um, well, so, well, certainly the whole managed care movement, I think, has um, affected the private practice of medicine. Um, I think, it, and it's hard to separate the, the governmental influence and the HMO movement. Um, I, th I think it has, um, you know, physicians don't feel uh, that they can control their practices, or I think there are fewer private practitioners now than, than there used to be. Um, there's more rate setting. Uh, you know, I think it has uh, very much affected the practice of medicine as it was, say, 25 years ago. And many more physicians are in groups, I think, they're, um, or have felt at some point they um, move on to another field. Right. How do you feel that the, well, just the public's access to health care in general has been affected by the government and managed care and all that? I think probably more people have access to health care, um, again, through the governmental influence, because I some HMOs have to take so many um, Medicaid patients, for example, and that theoretically more people have access to health care. Um, it, it feels as though sometimes the patient, um, you have to really advocate for patients to get what they need. Um, it feels like a system that, um, you know, looks at the numbers rather than at the individual patient. And the physician has to be much more active in demanding uh, reimbursement for the care they feel their patients need. So, um, and in some ways, patients have more access to health care, but um, you know, in terms of what patients really need, too often I feel yeah, um, you really have to fight for. When did HMOs first impact your practice? Um, hmm. Maybe about 15 years ago. I, you know, I think one example, you, you perhaps would be seeing a patient and they would say, well, my insurance has changed. Uh -huh. And uh, I now go to a health care plan that's a closed plan and you can't be my doctor anymore. And it, it would feel as though that was like a sudden change. Yeah. Um, and although it pushed physicians to become involved in more like open plan HMOs, there were some that were much more difficult to, to join. Um, so, and the other, the, the um, plans that you did join uh, there were, particularly in psychiatry, so many sessions would they pay for. Um, and again, although a patient may have a particular diagnosis, there were many other variables that affected that patient's ability to uh, be treated and to get better. And it felt sometimes that they were rigid, the rules were rather rigid. Um, and there was not an understanding from the case managers who were involved in um, the whole plan of all these conditions. On the other hand, if you really advocated and fought for your patients, <laughs> sometimes you were able to get what they needed. But it, it certainly was a difference in um, your being able to treat patients as you had before. Because some of the insurance companies, if you, you know, filled out forms and you presented your case, it was much easier. Then in terms of hospitalizations, you know, years ago, um, if you were on a hospital staff and your patient needed to be hospitalized, you would hospitalize that patient um, at the hospital that you were on the staff. 
and more and more depended on the um, insurance company and they were dictating uh, which hospital would be appropriate for your patient. So that whole scenario changed. How have doctors' salaries changed over the course of your career? Well, I think certainly there was a, um, you know, from where I began, doctors' salaries were certainly increased. Um, you know, I think in the last probably five years, depending on your field and your specialty, because of the HMO movement, the, uh, the fee setting, the, uh, like in psychiatry, the number of sessions, there was a leveling off. So, you know, certainly it, it changed tremendously from when I first started. The, uh, I think an office, you know, session was, say, $25. Now, you know, it moved up, 75 whatever. But, um, you know, I think there's a leveling off, and because so many people have insurance, that, that um, there's a fee setting that doctors, you know, have to go along with those kinds of controls. But certainly, doctors make more than they did when I first started. And um, so has your income changed, like, in terms of, did you receive most of your income from, directly from patients early on, early on in your career, and now, like, you would receive it from insurance companies? Is that yeah, well, I always worked in an outpatient setting with a salary, and I had, uh, my, my, but in my private practice, years ago, the outpatient visits, people paid out of their pockets, and uh, when they'd come for private treatment. You know, if they didn't, couldn't do that, they would go to the clinic. But private cases paid out of their pocket. And in my last years of practice, most people had some kind of insurance so that there, there was insurance payments. You have to fill out forms, you know, go along with the insurance regulations. So in psychiatry, there was a big difference, you know, in, in the course of private practice. Uh, people paid from their pockets early on, and then later on, most people had insurance. How has malpractice insurance changed, as well as its impact on doctors' practices? Yeah, we could turn that up. You want to stop? How has malpractice insurance changed over the years? I think it's certainly increased tremendously. Psychiatry isn't uh, as bad as other fields, but it certainly has increased in um, the cost of providing care uh, is much more. It's much higher than it used to be, and malpractice is, is one of the things that has caused that to go up. But again, psychiatry isn't as bad as some of the other fields. Right. It, it's certainly um, the potential to be sued is so much greater now than it used to be. And, you know, you would think in psychiatry, well, the chances of being sued aren't so great. That isn't true anymore. I think... Um, you know, when you give more medication and have the potential for side effects. Um, and my last years of practice, um, the, to get your medical license, you had to have so much uh, continuing education uh, in prevention of, of in that area. But you had to be much more diligent in terms of your record keeping and giving careful thought to what you did so you weren't negligent. Um, you know, because if, say, you might have a suicidal patient or whatever, um, you were at risk. So, you know, in terms of malpractice, there was, it, it really, um, if people were suing much more. And you had to be much more careful in documenting um, what you did. And again, as a psychiatrist, you were as much at risk as other fields of medicine. How did you learn the business of medicine? I think it was on-the-job training. <laughs> and in my residency, I think we, we certainly learned uh, in terms of dealing with the patient, how to set limits with the patient, you know, how to talk about uh, financial issues with the patient. Uh, we learned that in my residency. Um, I think we certainly uh, had to learn how to deal with insurance companies, HMOs, um, you know, to think clearly about what, what, would, what were the expenses that you had, to put all of that in perspective. So I think it was on-the-job training, um, a lot of the business of medicine. 
you know, again, we did learn, you know, how to deal with patients. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you went into administration later on in your Yes, career. yes. Uh, would you like to talk more about that? Yeah, I did. Um, let's see. First, I um, became clinical director at the outpatient clinic where I had worked for a number of years and was involved in planning programs, planning for groups of people, um, ensuring that there was access. And, and that was that was lots of fun. I enjoyed that. Then I moved to being executive director, and I had to worry about the total finances of the, of the center. And that was very interesting, but it became more and more challenging to ensure that our clinic um, had positive cash flow, that we were, um, you know, being positive in, in our finances, to, to deal politically with um, the powers that be, and that that was interesting and challenging too, but but um, in you know much more difficult I found. And I moved away from patient care. I always kept um, some patients and continued to practice. Um, but I think when you see fewer patients, um, I think you don't have as many experiences to. Uh, for example, in, with new drugs that um, makes you comfortable in, in treating patients. So I think it was got harder and harder to do both, to, to practice clinically and to be an administrator. What are some changes that you've seen in the demographics of the Worcester community? Well, certainly the minority population is increasing. The, um, the Hispanic community is, is growing by leaps and bounds. I think the African American community hasn't changed that much. The uh, Asian community um, has grown. Um, and for example, the work with schools, there are many more kids who um, are minority and who, who are not doing well in school. Um, but certainly the demographics of Worcester has changed. And did the ethnic background of your patients change over the years as well? Yes, I think I saw many more, uh, many more Hispanic and actually African American patients. I think as access to care uh, was improved in Worcester, many more people came who didn't come in my early years, who never got uh, to treatment. But I think they were, um, you know, involved in systems that identified the need and pushed them for treatment. The schools were, were referring, the Department of Social Services was referring, um, and some of the health plans were referring. So I think part of the democratics of my practice changed because there was easier access to care for some of these populations. How has women's health in Worcester changed over the course of your practice? I think there's much more attention given to women's health. I think kids were sort of at the bottom of the pile. I think women uh, were not seen as a population that needed some specific care, um, both in terms of prevention and, uh, and treatment. So I think there, there are many more women physicians in Worcester. And um, I think uh, women are, are getting better treatment in Worcester. And many more conferences, seminars are devoted to women's health. Um, and the research, much, much more research is done on women now, rather than treating women based on the research done on men. So it's really exciting that uh, I think women's health all over the country and in Worcester is higher on the totem pole than it used to be. Yep. And what changes have you seen in children's health, uh, generally in medicine or in psychiatry? I think there's a lot more emphasis on prevention and uh, early intervention. And one good thing, the HMOs, I think they've really um, you know, had parents to be actively involved in their children's care and had a plan, ongoing plan, for children's health. Uh, 
So I, I think that's one positive about the HMOs. Then I think the public health department, there's a lot more publicity. The schools have been actively involved. I think um, children's health uh, has improved in, in Worcester. There's still a population, though, that uh, I think uh, people aren't getting the care that they need. And even though there's an improvement in, like, the outreach efforts, I think there's still a population that uh, there needs more to be done. Have you ever practiced anywhere else besides Worcester? No, I did not since I've been in active practice, no. Okay. I, why, uh, did, why did you choose to practice in Worcester? Well, Worcester was my husband's home. <laughs> His father was a practicing physician back then, and uh, we returned to Worcester, I think, for a few years. <laughs> and once we started to raise our family here, it was a comfortable place for kids, and we stayed. And I think I was really enjoying the work that I was doing at that time. What have you really liked about practicing here in Worcester? I think the in, in child psychiatry there, I enjoyed my involvement with um, schools and other agencies here in Worcester. I was very much in the community. And um, as a family, we've been involved in community organizations and in the community. And Worcester is still a small enough city that you can, uh, can do that. And, you know, I got to know people, um, you know, in the school department and other agencies and... Um, you know, I enjoyed that. So I think Worcester was a small enough town that um, that we enjoyed living here. Is it, has there been anything you don't like about practicing in Worcester? Well, I think there were few minority physicians here in Worcester. Uh -huh. And um, we have some friends in the Boston area, but it, uh, having grown up in the South, <laughs> that was a big change for me. And um, I, you know, I think we, we adjusted to it, but, um, you know, th I think we missed at some points in our lives that collegial relationship with other minority professionals. How did group practices or hospitals treat minority physicians early on in your career? Well, it was difficult to uh, become a member of the hospital staff. Um, you know, I, I think I didn't have a big problem, but certainly in Worcester, uh, for many, many years, uh, there were hospitals that didn't um, admit minority physicians. There weren't many minority physicians in Worcester. But um, in the 60s when I came, that had started to change. And I think it was more based on your credentials and, you know, what of what benefit you could be f to the hospital. Um, than whether or not you were a minority or not. But clearly, in years before then, there was reluctance to have minority physicians on hospital staffs in Worcester. But in the 60s, I think that had changed. How do you feel that the role of the physician in the Worcester community has changed over the years? Well, I think when I first came to Worcester, there were certainly many more private practitioners and um, you know I think like the referral network between physician to physician uh, was the path that referrals took uh, based on you know the hospital your hospital affiliation but that collegial group and I, I see that is really changing their group practices their physicians attached to hospitals but sort of that private practitioner referral base is very different than it, it was in years past. Um, you know, I think much more of the referral system is controlled by your insurance, uh, by your health plan, um, uh, and dictating, you know, what physicians can or can't do. So the sort of the independent solo practice, <laughs> deciding your own plan for your practice, uh, is different than it was before. Yeah. How have public, how has the public perception of doctors changed over the years? Well, I think years ago it was certainly percept, uh, the perception that doctors know best, that whatever the doctor told you didn't question, you did. <laughs> and I think that's different now. 
I think people are asking more questions. They're coming to doctors having read, whether it's through internet or hearing something about the media, uh, having some uh, information uh, and knowledge when they come to see physicians. So I think it's not as much your, your doctor knows all, he's the end all. So I think that's, that's very different than, than it used to be. And certainly in, in, in my practice of child psychiatry, more and more patients in the clinic where I work were, were, were sent there by DSS, or, and they really didn't want to be there. By the courts, uh, they didn't want to be there. So it took a while to engage them and to have them really become active participants in their care, because they didn't want to be there. Um, but certainly the era doctors know best, and I'm not going to question my doctor. I think that's gone. <laughs> some, some patients are like that, but many patients are, which is good, I think, are asking questions and wanting to be more knowledgeable and know about their conditions. Like you mentioned earlier, with the drugs. And right. Are there Worcester physicians that you admired when you started practicing here? Yes, very much so. I uh, certainly in the field of psychiatry and child psychiatry and pediatrics. I can always had a um, interest in pediatricians. You know, there were some some physicians I think who went, you know, beyond the call of duty. Who were, say, for example, pediatricians always available to their patients, uh, who were. I can remember our pediatrician um, who had you think of some really common sense things that you could do when you were panicky, who were just very, very good with, 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 with parents. And physicians who, were, who made house calls, who really took time with patients to, to listen to their family problems as well as their medical problems, who were really, um, you know, I think family practitioners. Um, I was impressed by the... Uh, sort of the art of medicine mm -hmm. that uh, some physicians did well, not just the science of medicine, but yeah. uh, the art of medicine. Were, they were exemplary in that, in my opinion. How have you seen doctor-patient relationships change over the course of your career? Well, I think doctors, uh, you know, don't have the time that they used to take with their patients. Certainly there are some doctors who continue to do that and don't always look at the 15-minute clock who, if they really think a patient is very much in need, they, they take that time. Um, but there are other people who are really pushed to say, uh, you know, I can only spend X amount of time with you. I think in some practices they've involved other people, uh, nurse practitioners, um, they have nurses, who are in their offices, who, who case managers, who take up some of that slack. But it has, in some instances, moved the physician more away from, the, uh, from knowing about the patient, knowing about the, the patient's family, taking that extra time to be with the patient. So that, um, you know, I think the, the patient-doctor relationship has changed, and I think some of the, how, who gets paid for what, has influenced that relationship. But again, some doctors continue to take the time to really know their patients and know about the patient and the families. What was it like for the female physician in Worcester in the 50s and 60s, and how has that changed over the years? I think you didn't have a lot of colleagues. You know, there were, there, there were few practicing physicians. Um, there were always a couple in, in psychiatry that I knew, but certainly the field of medicine was predominantly male. And uh, certainly that has changed in Worcester, all over the country. That has changed, but that was very, very different. You know, the medical societies, you know, all of the um, hospital staff uh, were predominantly run by, by men. There just weren't many women here. <laughs> and. Um, I don't know that women who really push to be leaders were denied. It, it probably wasn't easy, yeah. but I think if someone really had pushed hard and was pretty aggressive, they could have moved forward in, in Worcester.
with all the changes in medicine over the years, um, and with medicine being such a growing field, how have you kept up with the changes in education after you graduated med medical school and throughout your career? I think it wasn't easy. I didn't, I didn't work in a like a medical school setting, although I did attend some conferences there. But um, because of the really rapid changes, you know, I would go to um, like. Boston, Mass General, and for psychiatry, Mass General and Harvard would have these biggie conferences during the year, and I would definitely go to those. And you'd think, what what's the cutting edge? What's the, you know, what's the knowledge? Uh, so you really had to go to conferences to try to keep up. And sometimes I missed just uh, talking to colleagues to compare notes. Uh, you know, what do you think of this new medication? What What do you know? Uh, what are we seeing? Uh, but there were just some major, major changes in psychiatry uh, during my years of practice, and it became increasingly difficult to keep up. Again, you'd go hear about the new things, but it, um, you know, there was need to then try them out to make them a part of your practice, to have enough patients using some of the new medications. And just, just the new trends in psychiatry, again, the, the sh big shift to um, understanding some disorders and some that really had a neurological basis that, you know, we thought it was more uh, interactional before or psychological before. There were major, major changes in psychiatry. So, so it just, it really was, was um, in my last years, really a major challenge to try to keep up because you're not, you know, my training from years and years ago, um, you know, it was just very, very different now. All right, well, we have about a minute left here, and uh, well, in that minute, could you tell me what advice you have for younger doctors? Um, you know, I, th I think you should know, um, you should know what you're getting into. <laughs> And I think to to have a mentor and colleagues that you can talk with is so very, very important. Um, and looking back, um, in some instances, that association, I think, um, would have helped me if I'd had a mentor or just colleagues that you really could meet with on a regular base, basis and talk with uh, to compare your practice with that. I think when you're really close to a hospital or you're, you're in a ho practicing in a hospital setting, that's re readily available.